Okay, questions or comments on each of the presentations? Arturo. Thank you, Peggy. I, hello, thank you very much, Janice and Eric. Uh, I would like uh, to, to extend the comment from the low and middle income country perspective. And basically, because I think, uh, given our global perspective, this is very important for us to consider. We've heard uh, from Patrick and, and uh, other speakers how our handling of mental health issues is inappropriate, how the costs are staggering, and how we lack, for example, here in the United States, the, the psychiatrists and the infrastructure needed but also we lack effectiveness in attending mental health issues as they are related to violence. If this is the case in, in the richest country and most powerful country in the world, can we imagine what it is like in low and middle income countries? I would add to what Mark was saying, it's a sticky, wicked, and swelling problem, and blooming problem, uh, that is so big and, and growing that I think uh, it was a great uh, to hear from Dr. Insel that with the current knowledge that we have, we could attend to it. We could prevent large numbers of this. Just so that you get a sense, in our country, we have in Mexico, we have close to 500,000 deaths from violent causes over the last decade. And what I would like the speakers to comment about is if we focus on the top of the pyramid, in the tip of the iceberg, homicides, suicides, we are failing to see the, the base, the huge base of the pyramid with uh, PTSD because of victimization, for example, untreated PTSD because of uh, large victimization numbers in, in developing countries, uh, gender uh, violence and its implications for uh, developing adolescents, bullying in schools. What, what would you comment regarding the base of the pyramid? I mean, could we, is, could we focus on population level interventions that could actually have a dent on the bigger base? Uh, because I think that is what is needed. And one example that we will talk about uh, tomorrow is alcohol but maybe you could talk about these social determinants that could help us improve overall outcomes, not only the specific uh, lethal outcomes that we have been discussing. Thank you. Well, I certainly agree with that or the implications of the, of the comment and question. Um, the critical issue, and I'll use the United States for a moment. The critical issue in the United States around suicide prevention is most suicides occur when people are not in care or used to be in care or are in the workforce or in the community where when you do something like a psychological autopsy you go and find oh I realized he was upset but I never realized he was that upset the failure to detect is huge and so the implication of that is is that if you keep trying to detect the individual the needle in the haystack you will fail so from a public health point of view you really do have to go upstream or distal to those common risks, those common life circumstances. And those are not just in the individual, they're in the community and the family. And uh, in working in China, and colleague with, with Michael and others, it's very clear that there are many lessons in, in uh, economically developing countries in, around the world that have much relevance to the United States. The United States is never going to have sufficient resources, and again I'm bringing it back here to show the, the almost the absurdity of it, sufficient resources to treat all the mental health problems of all the people so they don't go on to die by suicide. They never get identified as mental health problems in the first place. Um, men in the middle years, you know, I know that men in the middle years are totally expressive of their inner emotions and they always go and seek help and say, hey, let me tell you how I feel. Well, if I believe that, I could actually go to one of my own psychiatric units. Um, it's such a delusional thought. So it's very clear that the notion of looking for what we might call things at the base of the mountain, the, the bottom of the iceberg, are really, I think, unifying across the world. The attempt in the United States to solve with um, 
let's give more psychopharmacology to everybody, has actually been an experiment that's been underway in this country now for 25 years. Um, that can be marked with the SSRI revolution, if you want to call it. Hey, it's easier for everybody to give SSRIs. And so we would say if that experiment's been underway, it's failed because we've seen the suicide rate drop in the 1990s, but then rise in the, in the uh, 21st century and rise very substantially. Um, and it, there, there's never going to be enough exposure, if you would, of those people who are at risk to, to those interventions because the interventions tend to be more privileged people who have access to insurance and medical care and all those other things. And so it almost becomes a, a, a catch-22. So I very much agree with you. I think that there is tremendous commonality around community engagement. Um, I think the challenge is that we have viewed suicide as a quintessentially, and I'll use suicide now, but homicide as a quintessentially individual problem. Now, growing up, I remember, I don't know if you remember, but when there were uh, the Thanksgiving holiday or the Labor Day holiday, they would always announce the road accident statistics, the road injury statistics after that, and so many people died. They raised the national understanding that this was a public health problem and that they, again, it's an injury, not an accident. It's predictable. It's, it's, it's something we can do. We do not have that will in the United States yet to talk about suicide to talk about the mental health burdens of people, to not stigmatize in so many different ways, um, talking about the uh, discriminatory policies and other kinds of things that, that make it hard. And I think that that's true in other countries. I, I, I'm not uh, as expert as Michael is about China, but the notion of going around and expressing your emotions openly and seeking help for your emotional distress when you've had a romantic breakup or you have a great personal uh, crisis is not something that's commonly held. Um, so there's a lot of work to do and, and a lot of, I think, to be learned across national and cultural boundaries. I'll put boundaries in quotes. Do we have other questions or comments? Yes. You can, you could, oh, I was going to say, if, if you could come up to the table, that would be great. We're supposed to have, oh, there is a microphone behind you. But. And Hello. maybe just identify yourself so, first. Yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, Sina Fazel. I'm a psychiatrist based in Oxford. Um, just a, 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 a one comment and, um, well, a couple of comments. One is, um, this, is this is to Dr. Kane, but also Dr. Insel um, referred to it, is, is when people are talking about the magnitude of the risk, um, everyone seems to be comparing suicide with homicide. Um, and, and I just wonder if that's the right comparison to make because, of course, interpersonal violence is more, much more than homicide. And if you look at um, studies done on uh, particularly people with mental illness, the rates of uh, interpersonal violence are uh, quite high. One year after discharge from hospital, ECA study found 12%, MacArthur study found somewhere between 20 and 30%. So if, if, if you want to look at magnitude of risks, I think it depends on what you use as your outcome. Because if you use interpersonal violence um, in a broader sense, um, it's, it's, it's very high. If you look at violent crime, it's convictions. It's also probably two or three times the rate of suicide lifetime risk. Um, so I think th this, this idea that, yes, suicide is the main issue, I think is, I, 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 I wonder about. The, the, the second point I have to make is about e ecological studies. I mean, of course, they're, they're very difficult um, because, because there, there are lots of explanations which one, one can't measure. But I think um, there is some work on income inequality being a major um, uh, determinant of a range of adverse outcomes. Um, you've probably heard of Wilson and Pickett's work at, um, where they looked at a whole range of adverse outcomes from you know, childhood, maternal uh, uh, adverse outcomes, but also um, I think suicide and violence. And I, I, I think um, we've tried to replicate that for, suicide, for, for homicide and, and, and uh, assault rates around the world. And we found that that probably holds for lower middle income countries. So the, I suppose the other point I wanted to make about ecological studies is, is probably there is probably some merit in stratifying the ecological framework for low middle income versus high income countries. Well, let me, let me comment on, on this in a couple of ways because I very much agree with you. Suicide, as I've written about, is an entry key. If one looks at, at dead as the target, then in fact we, we are I think that's missing the point. It's really all the things that potentially lead to suicide. Of course, in the United States, attempted suicide is probably 20-fold annually, 600, 700,000 
Uh, and those are only the ones that come to emergency departments. We don't see that. If you take, if you take deliberate self-poisoning, where you don't know the intent, then we've upped it even further, because those are often not even classified as suicide attempts. Um, and so I think it's very clear that ultimately, I agree with you, it's not about just focusing on the people who are dead. It's a focusing on the lives of the people who maybe become dead. Some of them have a higher probability than others. And how do we change lives at the individual level and at the at the societal level. That's really, the, uh, I think, the ultimate task of this. Um, and so I really wouldn't argue. It's just, you know, where do you pick to begin? What's your entry? You know, what door do you go through? Not where do you end up? Um, and so I think that that's really uh, an important point. I agree with it. But I think I could find some numbers that would up the, up the ante on self-injury if, if, if needed to compare to injury to others. Ultimately, the person, we know that people who, um, there was a, a small-scale study, uh, and one of the reasons that we do a lot on self-injury and intimate partner violence together is because people, in, men in the middle years who go on to die by suicide often have been perpetrators of intimate partner violence before. And so that you were a perpetrator of intimate partner violence and convicted or in the law, and then you go on to die by suicide uh, later on after having threatened and, and, and at times manipulated your partner with that suicide threat. Nonetheless, it means you're you're also you know you're you're not doing well to someone else who's a victim, but you're also potentially not doing well to yourself. It's very intermingled, and in some ways, the goal is not to separate them out, but rather to see the common risks underneath and focus on those risks and adversities. Okay, thanks. I'm I'm going to ask actually going to ask Janice to sort of end the discussion with either you can address this and also make a final okay. comment, and then we're going to have to go to break or we're not going to get one. All right. So. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to comment uh, in a way that drew on uh, both, both of the uh, questions or comments that we had to do with, uh, with focusing on low-income and middle-income countries. Um, I mean, when we do that, we see that homicide rates are higher in <coughs> low-income countries than suicide, and it's, the pattern is reversed for, um, for high-income countries, higher suicide. Um, and the um, interpersonal violence is also uh, quite a bit higher in um, developing and low-income countries, um, which is uh, rape and sexual assault is uh, shockingly, appallingly high um, in uh, many places around the world, um, in, in particularly low-income countries. And to, to connect this to what, ca what can we do about it in terms of services and, uh, you know, if, if this is the best we can do in, in this country, what about other places? I think that a great deal needs to be done. Um, it needs, it's about political will, well, it's about resources, and that this notion that there is scarcity and that countries who are low income should simply make do with um, poor or inadequate lack of medications, lack of, of treatment, is simply, it simply can't stand. We simply can't um, allow that, and it flies in the face of amazing uh, efforts on the part of family and kin who will travel. I'm thinking of Oaxaca. I'm thinking of Chiapas in the south of Mexico. We'll, we'll travel for hours and hours and days to, to public hospitals and, and be in line to get anything they can. And, and they're very motivated. And, and uh, public awareness is increasing. What we have is a problem of capacity and to get rid of what I would call the culture of the idea that it's acceptable to have scarcity. That's true in this country. That's true in the rest of the world. That's my comment. We're going to take a 10-minute break. So I'm going to ask everyone to please be back by five minutes after 11. We're already behind schedule, as probably could have been predicted. But thank you very much, panelists. For